So, um, if you read that little introduction that I wrote in the book, you'll have noticed that I um, was troubled when I first began to uh, think about the conference this year by the fact that it was our 17th year. And I thought, 17, what kind of number is that? It doesn't have the kind of iconic quality of 10, a decade, or, or 20, a generation, or 100, a, a centennial. Uh, and then somebody pointed out to me that it was a prime number. Who knew? And, and as I began to look into prime numbers, I discovered what a deep and mysterious and fascinating world that was. And then it hit me. Math. I had learned how to add and subtract and multiply literally in grade school. I had a vague recollection of courses called algebra, <laughs> trigonometry, calculus. I had even attended those, but wiped clean. <laughs> had no idea and had never used them. And even though I realized that math was at the deep basis of just about everything, my contact with it was many, many eons ago. And of course, now we have these devices that do most of this stuff for you. So I thought, we have to kick off the conference by reacquainting ourselves with math. And I sent out the beaters and I said, find me a man, find me a woman, find me someone who is a scholar of math, a teacher of math, someone who can bring us back not only to the necessity of math, but the beauty of math. And it turns out such a man is right here. His name is John Mighton. He is a playwright, but he is also a mathematician and has these handy little workbooks to help you recover some of the knowledge that you may have forgotten. They're all available in the bookstore upstairs. You must visit the bookstore upstairs. So, John, can you launch us on our journey and help me relearn yeah, I'd be. I'd be happy to. Thank you. So I think I'm going to need that board over there. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so I'm very honored to talk to you today. I'm a playwright and mathematician and the founder of a charity called Jump Math. Um, I'm going to try and convince you today that the number 17 is very important, not only because it's the 17th anniversary of Idea City, uh, but because uh, there are many other important properties that the number has that I think some of them w w may actually surprise you. So I, I have to start, though, with some bad news. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of Pythagoras. Uh, the Pythagoreans were very fanatical about numbers. They thought that all numbers or all quantities could be represented as a ratio of two numbers, as a fraction. Uh, and there's a legend that when the mathematician Hisippus uh, discovered that the square root of two could not be represented as a fraction, uh, his Pythagorean uh, colleagues were so upset that they threw him overboard. So when I was preparing for this talk, I did some research and found out that the Pythagoreans thought that the number 17 was utterly ab abhorrent. It was an abomination. So I was a little nervous about giving this talk. <laughs> uh, but I happen to believe that the number 17 is a very beautiful number. Uh, for one thing, it's a prime number. And you may recall from school that the prime numbers are the counting numbers or the natural numbers greater than one that only divide by themselves or the number one. Now, it's really hard to overstate the importance of the prime numbers. For one thing, they're the building blocks of mathematics. That's because of this theorem, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, all numbers greater than two, all natural numbers, can be de decomposed into a unique product of prime numbers. So you see 84 there is two times two times three times seven. Now, many mathematical proofs depend on breaking numbers down into their prime constituents. And because mathematics underlies so much technology and science, the prime numbers play a huge role in our everyday lives. So to give an example, um, the internet and our banking system depend on a way of encrypting data uh, that works because of prime numbers. So the sender of a message is given a large number. They use it to encode their message. And then the receiver of the message uses a second number to perform a really beautiful calculation that decodes the, the message. 
And this whole system works because the public, the public key, the, the number that was used to encode the message, is the product of two very large prime numbers. And computers are quite good at multiplying large prime numbers, but they're extremely slow when they're given the product and have to factor it back into the prime numbers. In fact, if the prime numbers are big enough, it could take the lifetime of the universe to perform the calculation. So your data is safe for now. <laughs> Uh, until we uh, figure out a way to factor numbers quickly or build quantum computers, which is something that's just on the horizon. So among prime numbers, uh, the number 17 has a lot of properties that, properties that make it particularly interesting. For instance, it's a twin prime, which means there's another prime that differs from it by two, the number 19. Um, now, even to this day, mathematicians don't know if there are an infinite number of twin primes. So there should be work for mathematicians for some time, we hope. Mathemati um, the prime numbers and the number 17 also show up in interior design and decoration. Um, there are exactly 17 patterns, 17 classes of patterns that remain invariant under transformations of the plane, under reflections, rotations, and translations. And these are called the wallpaper group. Prime numbers also turn up, and the number 17 turns up in Sudoku. Recently, uh, mathematicians proved that if you want to create a Sudoku puzzle that has a unique solution, you have to use at least 17 numbers. And this may not sound very important, but they proved this use and developed techniques in proving it that are now expected to be, uh, have great applications in genetics and software development. Now, uh, <laughs> A haiku has 17 syllables. And I, I, I mentioned this mainly so I could show you one of my favorite haikus. A teacher gave her grade four class an assignment to write a haiku, and I guess one of the students wasn't terribly impressed because he wrote this. Five syllables here, seven syllables there. Are you happy now? <laughs> so um, you can imagine a world in which, or an alternative history in which people got obsessed with writing poems of 19 syllables. And they called these things haikus rather than 17 syllables. But you cannot imagine a world in which the wallpaper group has more than 17 elements, doesn't have exactly 17 elements. And that's one of the most beautiful things about mathematics. Um, math in mathematics, you can, you can discover and prove things that have to be true in every world, in, in every universe that could exist. And you can prove these things sitting at a table with nothing more than a pencil and paper and your imagination. And this is what um, the physicist Wigner called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. So over and over again in the history of science, um, mathematicians have created and solved problems that seemed trivial at the time out of sheer curiosity or a sense of wonder. And over and over again, 50 years later or 500 years later, um, this math is exactly what scientists needed for the next great breakthrough in science. It happened in relativity and quantum mechanics and genetics and field after field. Um, and one of my favorite examples uh, is from the 1800s. People were interested in how many colors you needed to color a map so that two countries that shared a border didn't get the same color. Now, that again may seem like a rather trivial problem, but a mathematician uh, suggested that we replace the countries with dots, put a dot in the center of each country, and uh, if, a country, if two countries share a border, join those dots with a line. So you can see the shape on the right is, a, is an equivalent representation of that map called a graph. Now that graph uh, could represent the World Wide Web, it could represent a computer circuit, it could represent something much more abstract, like a set of entities that have relationships between them. And graph theory that came out of these kind of recreational problems is, now underlies most of computer science and, and much of mathematics. So I hope these examples have given you some sense of um, how important numbers like 17 are, how important the primes are and also a sense, of, perhaps, of how much we lose as a society, how much knowledge and wealth we fail to create because we have a, a, a relatively enumerate society. But I think there are actually deeper losses um, to our society that I'd like to talk about today. 
So about eight years ago, a teacher in Toronto um, decided as, a, as action research to try a different approach to math, and she tested her kids coming into grade five on a standardized test called the TOMA, and this is what the bell curve looked like. The average mark was in the 54th percentile, and there were kids as low as the 9th percentile and as high as the 75th. Now, this distribution of marks is very typical. I've seen it in hundreds of schools. It's hard to find a school where you don't see that kind of difference in grade five. That would be about a three grade level difference between the bottom and the top students. Um, and I think we've, as a society, we've accepted this as natural. Um, we think it's normal to see this. And the differences just get greater and greater through the years. So the teacher tried uh, the JUMP program for a year and followed it very faithfully. And, and when she retested her kids in grade six, this is what the bell curve looked like. The average mark was in the 98th percentile, and the lowest mark uh, was in the 95th. And the most exciting thing is a year later, the kids all signed up for the, math, the Pythagoras math competition. One missed because of a doctor's appointment. But of the 17 who wrote, um, 14 got awards of distinction, and the other three came close. So this class looked like a very strong class after two years. And grade five is very late to intervene. You can imagine if, if, if kids were given great support in math at a younger age, might, what might happen? So the question is, why don't we see this more often? And that's a very complex question. And I, I think one reason is um, there's research that suggests that as early as kindergarten, kids start comparing themselves to each other and deciding who's smart and who isn't in math. Uh, you may have done it yourself. You may remember that moment yourself. And once children decide they're not in the talented group, their brains stop working. They stop paying attention, remembering things, getting excited, taking risks. And because math is like a ladder, if you miss a step, it's hard to go on. Um, it's very easy to reinforce that belief. And so I, I think kids are always ranking themselves, and we're always ranking them. And we do it innocently. We don't think there's any particular problem. I mean, we assume that kids have to decide whether they're good or not. Um, but what if, what if every child, or virtually every child, could learn math? Then I don't think we could have devised a better system for preventing that from happening. Because as I said, as soon as you rank yourself and decide you're not in the talented group, your brain starts, stops working. Now, there are other reasons I think we don't see radical changes in ability. Um, teachers are my absolute heroes. They've been responsible for the growth of jump math. But many teachers will admit that they, they don't know the math deeply, um, that they're a little intimidated by it, and they would love to be able to learn it. Um, and the good news is we think that not only, only every child can learn math, but every teacher can learn to be a, a very passionate and great teacher of mathematics. So I know that may sound unbelievable, and I know many of you have, may have suffered from, from your own experiences in math. So I just want to give you a sense of why this might be possible. Um, I mentioned prime numbers are divisible only by, uh, by one in themselves. So what does di divisibility mean? So I'm going to take you back. I hope this doesn't cause any panic. Uh, but ironically, logicians proved 100 years ago that all math can be reduced to trivial steps that anyone should be able to understand. So in my opinion, math should be the subject that drives confidence and drives engagement for students. We're completely wasting an opportunity. So let's look at you know, one representation of division that may have terrified you is long division. Now I wonder, is there anyone in the room, you may, you, you may know how to perform long division, but is anyone who, anyone who could give me a simple explanation of why it works? How many people think they could give a really simple explanation of why that, the method of long division works. So I don't see many hands. <laughs> um, so we call the method of jump guided discovery. We don't, mean, we don't believe in spoon feeding kids. It's important to allow them to discover things, to figure things out for themselves. Um, but the research in cognitive science is suggesting you also have to give them a good deal of guidance. So you can, for instance, structure a lesson around Socratic questions, a series of challenges and activities. So here, um, if I said, this is three friends, and they want to share seven dimes and two pennies. So I hope you can imagine that. And normally, we'd make sure every student gets that representation before we start. Now imagine dividing up the dimes. Would you have any trouble dividing the dimes among three friends? So you, we even ask students to draw some circles for the friends. And can you visualize how many dimes would end up in each 
with each friend. I could draw X's for the dimes. I start placing the seven dimes and keep going, and hopefully you can see that eventually every friend will get two. Now, if I gave anyone in this audience a chance to practice that, I, I hope you can see there's no, no great depth there, no great challenge. And then here's where the discovery comes in. Uh, I could say, you'll see, if, if you are a student, I could say, you'll see adults doing this strange algorithm, this strange uh, procedure. Can anyone tell me where they see a two in this picture? Where do you see a two? Yeah? It's yes, there's two. Each friend got two dimes. That's what that two is. You gave away two dimes. What about the six? Can you help me again? <laughs> the six. Yeah, okay, everyone wants to show off. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what happens. You know, the one, I'm a playwright. When I started volunteering in inner city classrooms, I realized the only advantage we have of putting kids in a group, they're an audience, and they'll never get more excited as an audience. But hierarchies destroy any audience effect. You have half the class terrified and half the class not wanting to look like nerds. So six is, is the uh, number of dimes you've given away. And what's the one for your bonus question? <laughs> it's the one that's left. So is there any problem understanding those steps? Now, uh, the big mystery is the bring down step. So when I'm with kids, I, I, I say there's still two pennies left over. Suppose those are the two pennies. And I pretend I'm dumb. And I, I give one kid a dime, one a penny, and one a penny. And so they, I say, there, I gave them away. And the kids always say, no, that's not fair. We would regroup that dime as 10 pennies. <laughs> and so look, how many pennies do you have left? 12. That's what this mysterious bring down step is. When you bring down the two, you're regrouping that bigger unit as a smaller one. Now you've got 12 pennies, and then you carry on. So I can guarantee you that um, all math right up through calculus is that easy. But it's a well-kept secret, and mathematicians certainly don't want anyone to know that. So if you're interested, um, because we're a charity, we've made these, these uh, lesson plans for grades 1, K to 8 available on our website. We, we just added K um, for the, on our US site. And you can read through those lesson plans. And we wrote them so that teachers could teach themselves the math. We had two very math-phobic teachers in Vancouver. Um, one barely made it through teacher's college. And she was terrified of teaching math. They both went on to do masters in math education after working their way through these guides. These were written by a team of mathematicians. We spent years thinking about how to scaffold the math into, into sensible steps. You may even discover things like this. I asked uh, about 700 teachers at the Calgary Teachers Convention why, when you divide 7 by 2 thirds, you can flip and multiply. And someone yelled out, because you get the right answer. <laughs> But if you go on our website, there's a little video that explains that mysterious operation. It's absolutely trivial, just like the long division. Now, I mentioned the losses to our society. Um, this is a picture of kids uh, learning about binary codes. You can see the sense of excitement, the happiness, <laughs> binary codes of all things. Uh, you know, we would think that kids were stunted if they didn't see any beauty in a mountain or a star. But we think it's totally natural for them to graduate from high school without any sense of the invisible beauty of the world. Um, and that's the greatest loss for me. Kids are born with a sense of curiosity and wonder, and they lose it gradually through school, through failure. And I, people think it's strange that I'm a playwright and mathematician, as if, if I'm using one half of my brain, I have to leave the other half empty for storage. <laughs> but, but that's not the case. And we don't have a population that are just artists or scientists. We can have people that grow up engaging with the world on every level and using every part of their brain. So if you want more information on this, um, I wrote an article that's on our website on the cognitive science of learning math. Uh, so it's been an honor talking to you, and thank you so much. Thank you, John. Let's do a Thank you. shot like that <laughs> against the board. Okay, great. Like yeah, a little closer. A little closer. Look at me. Thank you. Yeah, I was one of those kids. I thought I wasn't interested in math, didn't know how to do math, never pursued math. Ironically, I was too. 
So that's, that's why I'm so passionate about this. And, and do you give classes, sort of after our classes for adults? Well, any, anyone, we've had many parents attend our training sessions where we talk about these things, and so it's, it's open to anyone. Anyone? Yeah. That might be even, me. Even you. That's great, John. <laughs> Thank you.